Now we have a uh, next presenter uh, uh, is uh, the Reverend Peter A. Barnett. Amen. And we want to receive him as he comes. Uh, changing the future, forget it. Let's receive him. So then we were praying about it. My son is a, is a illustrator himself, 
And so we got together and we put together the name of the book um, that we, now it's on Amazon. And the amazing is, I'm like your book, nobody buys it. <laughs> because it's just intimidating. If, you know, the topic is something that uh, just people just don't want it to deal with. And the name of the topic is Change the Future, Forgive. I call it the F word. <laughs> Nobody wants to deal with it. And indeed, that's how we're going to change the future. And so, I'm not going to go too long into that, but you know, what I can bring into this conversation, I believe, is not only, um, it, it is also a very important point that uh, our sister raised, which I think is something that many people forget, that uh, most of the people of African descent who came out of Africa uh, did not come to the United States. Uh, the largest group went to Brazil and up and down the Caribbean. Uh, uh, and also, one of the things that must be entered into the conversation is that the, 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 the way of division sometimes between Jamaican, Caribbean folks and, and, and uh, African American folks and all these divisions that the enemy loved to bring about must also be dealt with and realize that we are all one. You know, so they, they, there's several different things we can deal with about that, but um, one of the things that really, that I want to focus on just briefly to the, this afternoon is back again to, in Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Many times we hear that scripture and we forgot the context in which that message was given. And I believe when we understand the context in which that message was given, and some important principles around that, it can inform us about what we need to do going forward. I, I say that because I believe that uh, what happened in Charleston represents an opportunity for us in the 21st century to start a new phase in the civil rights movement. I believe it's time for the second phase, I would call it. Or if it's not the second phase, well then let's call it the third phase. <laughs> or if not the third phase, but it must be another phase. Because have you realized that of all the different um, issues that have happened this past summer, a racist act, there is no doubt at all that that man, young man, fully had a racial intent. But I wonder if you realize that uh, the news media hardly speaks about Charleston today. And yet, the other stories that are, you may have opposing views and go back and forth and wonder and maybe you wonder what happened, those are highlighted. And I believe one of the reasons is because we've got to get used to the fact that the, this new phase that was triggered at Mother Emmanuel is not going to be carried by the world. Or we cannot wait for others to lead the way with forgiveness because they have no way to know how to handle forgiveness. Um, one of the contexts that I'm going to talk to you a little bit in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it will also speak to us that it's time for new leadership to speak up. Now, you know, we can say, uh, and I understand and appreciate the references to the hardness of forgiveness and the maturity levels of believers within the church, but I believe that when, the, the, when Martin Luther King stood up and other leaders in the past, they stood up firmly with the Word of God <laughs> and they taught the immature to be mature Amen. in terms of looking at the scriptures as the basis of going forward. And so consequently, I think in our own mind, we must realize that what God is doing is not just in the church. What God is doing is not just among us. But what God is doing is with us for the world. It's with us for the world. We will have to engage just like how it was within the churches, the Mother Emmanuel, for example, where they met in the church and then took it to the street. It wasn't just us in the church waiting for the rapture. 
It was us in the church receiving this message and understanding how and what it is and then taking it out, then engaging, then being the leaders in those areas. You know, in Jeremiah chapter 29, the whole story of Jeremiah there is very interesting because if you remember the story, Israel had just been invaded by Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar had taken all the best guys and taken them over to, into Babylon, right? How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And it was during the time when Israel was in Babylon that the message came back and the Lord spoke to Jeremiah. And it's very interesting when you read what the Lord told Jeremiah was to write a letter, send it to one of the emissaries, to send it to the, 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 the diaspora, those who were scattered and abroad in, in Babylon. And it was in that context when he said, you are in Babylon. But even though you are in Babylon, and those of you from Jamaica, you know we sing that song about Boston on Babylon. You know, we, we, we're good. But it was in Babylon. One was in Babylon, under the oppression of Nebuchadnezzar, under the oppression of Babylonian systems, under the, under the oppression of unrepentant racism and unrepentant discrimination, unrepentant issues. It was in that context that the Lord said to them in Jeremiah 29 11, I know the plans that I have towards you. Plans of good and not of evil to give you a future and to give you hope. Now, when you look into that uh, entire story, I want you to realize that Jeremiah's message was not received. Just like this message will have opposition and do have opposition. It was not received when Jeconiah and other prophets who are the heir of the group within Babylon they were the current leaders of that era in Babylon. And when Jeremiah said, and you can read it in Jeremiah 29, the whole context is, Jeremiah said to them, it's going to take you 70 years before you're restored. And that those, now remember Jeremiah was back in Judah, <laughs> sent a message by emissary, we know you're in bondage, but the Lord said, it's going to take you 70 years. Meanwhile, during those 70 years, there are some things I want you to do. And I'll talk about those things in just a minute. But he told him some specific things to do in blessing the city. And he said, while you're there, when you bless the city, you're going to be blessed. Now, the guys who were in Babylon, the other Jewish leaders who were currently gathering the people together, they said, that's not true. They said, that's a lie. And they contradicted the prophetic word of Jeremiah. And they said, this time next year, we are going to all go back to Judea. The whole thing is going to be fixed. We, let's go for March. What am I saying? It's very important, I believe, to now listen to those whom God is raising up to speak a new voice. In my book, I talk about Psalms. You know, uh, you know, uh, in every era, in every movement, there are songs. Songs that carry. In Jamaica, there will be songs in the cane fields, right? Mm -hmm. Here, we would have songs in the cane fields in southern, in, in southern Florida, or, or we'd have songs from the cotton fields. But you know, after you come out of the cotton fields, the songs need to change. <laughs> <laughs> And so we've got to then now begin to think about some new songs. Songs that can capture the imagination of our generation. You know, there's a lot of advances that have happened since slavery. A lot of things have happened since the 1960s. We have a man of African descent in the White House. A lot has happened, you know, from Jamaica. You know, we had our independence from Britain in 1962. We've had a lot of different people who have been leaders up and down the Caribbean, all over. We've been leaders of our own countries for a long while. The issue is not power. The issue is not power. There have been countries all over Africa who have gained their own power. 
and their own independence, their own, their own armies, and their own judges, and their own militias, and all the police officers. That's not just the issue. I'm not saying it's not an issue. It's not just the issue. I believe, are we, we need to ask ourselves, are we at a place where we now need to begin to look at what reconciliation really looks like? Yes, yes. And begin to perform, uh, to, to, to bring leadership, not just to get a seat at the table, but now to bring leadership to build a land, to build a life, to build a nation, to build a community. And it's important that when we get to that stage, you know, it's like if you're looking around the neighborhood trying to buy a house, and then finally when you find a house you want to buy, your conversation's got to change. <laughs> huh? Now you're not trying to get a negotiation, it's a different situation. So I think sometimes the, the enemy wants us to keep listening to the same message before. And, and, and believe me, um, we need to honor all our leaders. Yes. Yes. But we also need to realize when some leaders are not leading in God's direction. Yes. And, and it's not a dishonor, it, it is not wrong to honor leaders. But it's also not wrong to be able to say, I understand what you're saying, but I think that prophetic word was right on. And I believe that's the confusion we have right now. In my book, I went through and uh, I listed uh, a lot of the different voices that we, we, we hear and we, that I've been speaking really ever since Dr. Martin Luther King died and, and right through the whole movement. Talk about Marcus Garvey, of course, I got to talk about Marcus Garvey, came out of Jamaica. You know, he was a big Pan African leader, spoke about his voice. I wrote a little bit about. Um, um, Booker T. Washington, um, Du Bois, yes. you know, all these different voices. Bob Marley speaks into that, the Rastafarian movement. Mm -hmm. Tupac speaks into that situation. And I think we are, a we are at a point where we need to engage those voices. And we need to say to people, we need to ask, we need to have this conversation among ourselves. Whose report do you believe? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. We really need to, and we know that we, we don't have to, we, we do not only need to have that conversation in church. We now need to move that conversation on the street, in the, in the universities and colleges. We need to move that, that conversation further. You know, my wife and I we were sitting out the other day watching um, um, uh, public broadcasting. We were shocked about something. Do you know that God is smart? <laughs> huh? there, are some, there are some inventions and some uh, things that he just unveil at the right time. One of the things that I believe God is unveiling in this generation is the ability for tracing your ancestors. Yes. 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 He is allowing people to prick their finger, their fingers and put their blood on tablets and shock the world. <laughs> because they realize they aren't 100% of anything. Thank you. <laughs> right? right. Not, so how are we now going to deal with that? Those are, those are new things that are coming up today. Real issues. You know, some, it's very clear in terms of being biracial, you can tell. But if you, the, the percentage of people who are biracial is increasing, not decreasing. Yes. That's the future. Yes. So my, my point today is, and I want to just to, you know, I, my book is it's available online at Amazon. We can, if you go on there and, talk, and type in Peter Burns, I hope you'll be able to find it. <laughs> you should be able to find it. Yeah. Like an huh? <laughs> Amazon.com, yes. One of the things that I put in my book is steps to, steps to healing. I believe that um, as parents, we as parents need to take responsibility to communicate to our children yes. that we have forgiven Amen. those who have hurt us. Yes. Yes. It needs to begin at the family level. Yes. Yes. 
And, you know, we, we talk a little bit about that. The Lord showed me a, a little thing on forgiveness, and I'm sure others here have done this. You know, it's like going to the court. You have a file with all the offenses. There's no question that the person is guilty. But then if you're the one that's been offended, you've got a choice to make. Will you become the, offend, the, 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 the judge, the jury, and the one who carry out the sentence? <laughs> Forgiveness says you're guilty, but I believe there is a judge who is a just judge. Yes. And I have confidence in that judge. And therefore I am giving him the case for him to make a decision. When we hold on to these offenses, it is really a statement against our God. Yes, it is. Not against the people.